So welcome to pinpointing the top questions and considerations about biosimilars in gastroenterology, a case-based discussion. I'm Dr. Russell Cohen, the director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center at the University of Chicago Medicine. And I'm Dr. Steve Hanauer, medical director of the Digestive Health Center at Northwestern Medicine's Feinberg School of Medicine. The learning objectives for today's discussion include defining biosimilars and extrapolation of indications and interchangeability on the basis of FDA definitions and guidance, to explain the similarities and differences between biosimilars and originator or reference biologics, as well as the difference between the terms biosimilar and generic, to evaluate key aspects of current FDA guidance that inform the healthcare provider's knowledge of the biosimilar approval process, manufacturing, and naming, as well as state regulations surrounding substitution practices, and to apply foundational knowledge on biosimilars to clinical situations relevant to our GI practices. So there are multiple biosimilars that are now FDA approved in the United States, and we are going to pay particular attention to the monoclonal biosimilars that have been approved for use in multiple diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease. There are currently two infliximab FDA approved biosimilars, the infliximab DYYB or Inflectra, and the infliximab ABDA or Renflexis as well as two FDA-approved biosimilars for Humira, or adalimumab, the adalimumab ATTO, Amgevita, and the adalimumab ADBM, Siltezo. So let's take a quick review of the core concepts regarding biosimilars. Biologics, including biosimilars, cannot be made generic because of their complexity. In contrast to simple chemicals, such as aspirin as an example, biologics are proteins that include a backbone amino acid sequence, which is surrounded by carboxyl groups that can be changed or altered depending on many situations within the environment. In addition, biologics and proteins that are biologic formulations can vary over time related to their structure as well as to the stability and how they are actually handled. So Steve actually covered um, many of the differences between the uh, biologic and a uh, standard chemical drug using aspirin as a very small molecule and the monoclonal antibody on the right hand side of the slide is a very large molecule. So not only are the size differences, the structures are much different. The monoclonal is much more complex and heterogeneous. Um, manufacturing, you know, the biologics are actually have to be made from living cells or organisms, and you cannot have an identical copy. While you can have an identical copy to a standard uh, pharmaceutical as, as a generic, the biologics can be more difficult to completely characterize. They are not stable, so you have to handle them uh, carefully um, by uh, what are the requirements often in the package insert. And also of interest is uh, particularly the monoclonal antibodies, you are going to still deal with immunogenicity, which is rather rare when you just are simply working with a small molecule. Because of the many factors that contribute to the production of biologic products, there have been many post-approval or life cycle changes to the reference biologics or the innovators. And indeed, through the life cycle of infliximab, there have been over 35 changes in the production that are all FDA regulated and FDA approved. Similarly, to other biologic preparations, including adalumumab, there have been nearly 20 uh, life cycle changes to the way that the compound is actually produced. Right. You know, Steve, I think the point is that you're making that even the medicines that we're using today um, are not exactly the same as the medicines that were approved a number of years ago, and people have to realize that. I mean, some people say, well, you know, the biologics you're using today are actually biosimilars to themselves. 
I don't know if that's exactly accurate because it still comes from the same originator cell line, but they clearly have differences including genetic drift and other changes over time that are going to happen when you have biological products. So, you know, Steve, many people say to me, well, are the biosimilars identical to the biologic drug? And clearly, identical copies can't be made because it is a biologic product. There is variations over time, and you actually went through those quite nicely with manufacturing and process changes. Just because of the complexity of the molecules and even post-translational modification, there's no way that you're ever going to have an exact copy of a biologic as you would, let's say, for a small molecule. You gave the aspirin example. Um, however, the biosimilars are highly similar, and they really um, have been the ones that are approved have to go through a very rigorous testing process to show that, and we'll go through this in this slide set. But by definition, the biosimilars are not generics. And that's simply because we cannot make an identical copy of a biological product. The biosimilar is a biologic product, as we mentioned, that's highly similar to a U.S. licensed reference biological product for which there are no clinically meaningful differences in safety, purity, or potency of the product. Yes, so the comparability exercises that are used to demonstrate that the biosimilar is highly similar to a reference biologic is scientific, robust, and highly regulated. Let's take a case example. A patient with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis in a 36-year-old woman diagnosed approximately one year ago. She is not improved following oral 5-ASA, prednisone, and mesalamine enemas. So, Russ, what would be our considerations in treating a patient like this? Well, you know, as someone who is active with their colitis, despite these therapies, particularly if she's not improved following prednisone, I think this is a patient that you would be jumping to a biologic agent, probably an anti-TNF, given the efficacy, the onset, um, the time of onset, which is rather short, uh, rather than going on to a slow-acting immune modulator. There are several different TNF agents that are approved for the use of moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. Let's briefly review the FDA process regarding biosimilar development. You know, Steve, I think, again, uh, we've harped on this a few times already, that while the generics can be an exact copies, and, and um, the slide that um, we can look at, it shows the process that a generic goes through. Um, the biologics have their own pathway, and uh, the biologic is initially has to apply for a biologics license application. Similarly, the biosimilar has to do a biosimilar biologics application. The biologics have the full report of safety and efficacy, and uh, the applicant has right of reference to essential investigations. The biosimilar has to be highly similar, as we mentioned, and the data showing absence of clinically meaningful difference has to be proven. There is a term of interchangeability. We're going to cover that a little bit later again in, in this program, but uh, currently none of the biologics that have approved biosimilars have approved interchangeable biosimilars, which may change in the future. Those are higher standards that we can cover uh, moving on. Our Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Association have developed similar stepwise approaches to the development of biosimilarities that are based on a totality of the evidence and approach to evaluating biosimilarity. In contrast to the originators that go through initial analytic and animal studies and phase one, phase two, and phase three studies in every single indication, the approach to biosimilars is somewhat opposite. Instead of requiring clinical studies for every indication, biosimilars initially go through a more extensive analytic study process to demonstrate this similarity to the originator, then animal studies, and then human pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies 
that demonstrate the near equivalence to the originator. This also includes clinical immunogenicity assessment in patients who are vulnerable to develop anti-drug antibodies. Subsequent additional studies may be performed in one or several of the originator indications, but according to this process, it is not necessary to do clinical studies for every indication that the originator has labeling approval. And instead, the biosimilar can be extrapolated from one indication to another as long as this stepwise approach and the totality of evidence supports the highly similar aspect of the product. So the goal of a biosimilar development program is to demonstrate biosimilarity between the proposed product and a reference product, not to independently establish the safety and effectiveness of proposed products in every single indication. I think what's very clear is how the development of the biosimilar concentrates on proving that you actually have a biosimilar to the reference biologic rather than proving that the biosimilar independently has to meet all the clinical criteria. So in other words, we know that adalimumab works in patients with both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and is FDA approved for both. The biosimilar applicants for adalimumab have to prove, for the most part, they are truly a biosimilar to adalimumab, that they do not have any clinically meaningful differences between them and the reference product. The same would be for infliximab and its biosimilars. That's why this pyramid in this slide shows the large majority of the time and effort is based on the analytics proving you would truly have a biosimilar, while much less time is needed to be done in the non-clinical, the pharmacology, and then clinical trials themselves. Returning to this case, a patient with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis who's not responding to mesalamine and or steroids, and we're considering treatment with adalumumab. Well, indeed, as Russ has mentioned, there are two biosimilar adalumumabs that have been approved by the FDA. However, they are not currently available. And that's because the FDA approval does not necessarily allow the marketing when patent litigation and patent processes are underway. And that's the case with the adalumumab biosimilars. Uh, they're currently undergoing legal review from a patent standpoint rather than the regulatory approval uh, basing on the safety and efficacy of the biosimilar product. So for the purposes of this case, let's explore what's known about these different biosimilars, even though they may not yet be marketed. As Steve mentioned, there are two biosimilar adalimumabs that are FDA approved, although currently neither have launched in the United States. And they're only compared to the reference adalimumab. They're not compared to each other, important key concept. But when compared to the licensed, and this is actually the US licensed and the EU approved uh, Humira branded uh, adalimumab, the primary structure, the protein content, the higher order structures, the size range and aggregates, charge, glycosylation, potency, Binding assays for TNF, soluble, membrane bound, um, FC, and the bioassay and mechanism of action exploration all met the criteria that the FDA have for these to be cleared as a biosimilar for both of the approved products. This slide demonstrates a study with a biosimilar adalumumab, formulation ABP501 which is going to be approved as adalumumab ATTO, has been administered to over 60 patients, as well as the originator adalumumab from the United States, as well as an originator adalumumab from Europe. And as you can see from this graph, all three agents, the biosimilar and the two approved formulations, have a virtual identical pharmacokinetic profile in healthy adults. So this slide shows the other FDA-approved adalimumab, ADBM, 
also looking at plasma concentration between the biosimilar and the U.S. approved uh, branded and the EU approved branded. And again, you can see how well the curves overlap. Both of these studies are in healthy subjects, not done in patients. However, their overlap is um, virtually identical. So in order to demonstrate biosimilarity in different indications, initially the ABP501 formulation of adalumumab biosimilar was studied compared to adalumumab in 500 patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And as you can see, the primary endpoint of this study was reduction of the ACR20 in patients administered one or the other formulation. And again, the two effects appear to be nearly identical as far as the clinical effects are concerned. The same is true for the other biosimilar adalimumab, the BI695501. Again, this shows the ACR20 response, which is a standard criteria for rheumatoid arthritis trials. You can see that the biosimilar in blue, the originator in orange, um, overlap very nicely in the ACR20 response. On the right-hand side of the slide, you have your safety data, treatment emergent, averse event data, related to trial drug, serious or leading to trial drug discontinuation also um, overlap very nicely as well too. So again, these are studies in patients with moderate severe rheumatoid arthritis. So the earlier data we showed you was in healthy subjects and now we're showing you data in rheumatoid arthritis. We also mentioned that immunogenicity must be tested in susceptible populations. And with the ABP501 biosimilar product, immunogenicity was tested in patients with rheumatoid arthritis as well as plaque psoriasis compared to the originator adalumumab. Now these populations were selected because patients with rheumatoid arthritis are mostly treated with methotrexate that can reduce immunogenicity, whereas patients with plaque psoriasis may be treated with monotherapy alone and may not have the impact of methotrexate on reducing anti-drug antibodies. And you can see from both studies in rheumatoid arthritis and in plaque psoriasis that uh, the biosimilar was very similar as far as the development of anti-drug antibodies, including neutralizing antibodies in the two different patient populations. Similarly, for the BI695501 at Alimumab ADBM biosimilar, anti-drug antibody rates between the biosimilar, the US approved originator, the EU approved originator, uh, also overlap very nicely, and these are in healthy male subjects. On the right-hand side of the slide, neutralizing anti-drug antibodies, um, also the rates overlapped very nicely, which is very reassuring and led to the uh, biosimilars both being approved. So the prior discussion of patients with rheumatoid arthritis and patients with uh, plaque psoriasis exemplify some of the aspects of extrapolation. In order for biosimilars to be cost effective, the FDA and the EMA have developed a pathway that does not require studies in every single indication of the originator. And as I mentioned earlier, if the drug has gone through all of the analytics, the animal studies, the pharmacokinetic and the immunogenicity studies, and if the mechanism of action is considered to be similar in different indications, then results from one or two clinical trials in another indication, such as rheumatoid arthritis or plaque psoriasis, can then be applied to all of the other labeled indications of the originator, including, in this situation, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease.
The extrapolation to these areas is not automatic. And per the FDA, the extrapolation is based on all available data. Uh, and it's not automatic from indication to indication. So, for example, you had a biosimilar infliximab in this case, who so had analytic studies, non-clinical studies, PK studies. The confirmatory studies, they have them in rheumatoid arthritis and also in plaque psoriasis. But subsequently, in order for the biosimilar manufacturer to get the approval for extrapolation to other areas, they actually have to provide to the FDA further information indicating why they believe that their products should be approved for the other indications. Uh, and the only indications that a biosimilar can possibly be approved for are the ones that the originated drugs already are approved for. A biosimilar cannot be approved for a different indication than the originator drugs. This extrapolation framework is actually applicable to our GI practices because as we are seeing, the approval of both a lumimab and infliximab, the approvals have not been based on studies in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So the FDA imposes this totality of evidence, which as I have already mentioned, requires the preclinical studies, as well as reference biologic experience across a variety of different disease states with different or similar mechanisms of actions, pharmacokinetics and distribution, immunogenicity, which we just mentioned may be different with baseline medications such as methotrexate or thiopurines, and also other endpoint factors, including toxicity. The scientific justification is if the drug is demonstrated to be biosimilar to the originator in one population, that it can then be extrapolated to the other indications of the originator's FDA labeling. So there's a few things that Steve and I want to discuss so far in this case. We've already looked at the safety and efficacy of the biosimilars. We've explained how they did not get initial testing in patients with IBD. They initially were approved on rheumatoid arthritis and plaque psoriasis because those are diseases in which they have a clearly defined endpoint that would be expected to change in a relatively short period of time that can be adequately measured. Uh, but what we haven't uh, talked about is that uh, our colleagues in Europe have been using biosimilars for years and are almost laughing at us, if you will, about our hesitance to do so. Both Steve and I are very aware of multiple presentations at meetings um, and now publications from our colleagues about their success in inflammatory bowel disease um, with them. And it's not only Europe. Uh, several of these have been developed initially in Asia, in Korea, and we've seen a number of studies both in other indications and in inflammatory bowel disease from both the Asian population as well as European studies that are increasingly being reported on. And it's interesting, as Russ mentioned, that in Europe, our colleagues in the European Crohn's and Colitis Organization just several years ago were very much opposed to the concept of biosimilars being introduced into the European marketplace. But if we now look at the ECHO guidelines, they actually are well accepted and are frequently utilized all across Europe. You know, Steve, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, well, would you rather use a biosimilar as a new start right off the bat in a patient you're going to start, let's say, on infliximab, rather than saying, oh, I have someone who's on a branded originator infliximab and changing them uh, to the biosimilar? Do you have any feelings about differences? Well, I think you point out several different possible reasons for using biosimilars. As you mentioned, a new start. And I frankly think most of us would have no trouble in patients who were going to start on one biosimilar and continue on it. A second reason would be because an uh, insurance company wants the patient to switch for financial reasons. And indeed, the whole concept of biosimilar development is to increase the access 
for patients to these drugs and to reduce the overall cost. This requires a little bit more scrutiny because most of us would probably continue the same agent, although there are increasing studies demonstrating the safety of this single switch situation. There's another indication that's actually less desirable, and that would be switching because the patient develops immunogenicity to the originator product. And in this situation, as we'll get to a little bit later, that is not an indication to switch to a biosimilar because the immunogenicity will be the same between the originator and the biosimilar, and the patients are going to be developing anti-drug antibodies to the biosimilar if they've already developed them to the originator. Yeah, I think that's a very important question. If someone's had an allergic reaction or has made antibodies against either the biosimilar or the originator, you would not switch them to the alternate. You know, there's actually a case we can move on to the next slide with this issue. So a 28-year-old man is diagnosed with Crohn's disease five years ago after one year of non-biologic treatment, starts treating with the brand name Remicade, infliximab at five milligrams per kilogram, gets the loading dose and is on every eight weeks. Does well for four years, but just as Steve mentioned at the last appointment, the patient mentions that he received a letter from his insurer indicating that his copay will be less if he switches to a biosimilar. So a very good example. Similar to adalumumab, there are now two biosimilars that have been approved and are marketed for infliximab. They've both been approved over the past year, one is marketed as Inflectra, it was previously CTP13, and the other as Renflexus, previously known as SB2. Both have been approved as biosimilars to Infliximab and have all of the indications of Infliximab except for pediatric ulcerative colitis, which is a orphan indication, and the biosimilarity regulations do not cover orphan situations. But let's review some of the data regarding CTP13. This slide, uh, similar to what we showed you before with adalimumab, same idea. So here we have a biosimilar in this to infliximab, CTP13, and the innervator infliximab, and this is a rheumatoid arthritis study. Again, the same endpoint you're going to see, ACR20 at week 30, and the biosimilars in the dark color, the infliximab innovator drug is in the light gray. And again, you can see a nice overlap in both the intention to treat population on the left and the per protocol population on the right. In addition, a second biosimilar to infliximab is what was previously known as SB2 and marketed in the United States as Renflexus. This also has been studied in rheumatoid arthritis compared to the infliximab innovator. And as you can see on the bar graph on the left, there were similar endpoint results as far as the ACR20 criteria is concerned, as well as a similar time frame for the results of this. And I should just mention that one of the reasons that rheumatoid arthritis is often studied for biosimilars is that it's just a larger patient population that is accessible for studies compared to the IBD population. Now we do have data though on the use uh, particularly of infliximab DYYB uh, in adult IBD from our European colleagues in particular. Uh, this uh, slide lists a few studies with uh, various numbers of patients. Uh, these are patients who were treated in some cases for Crohn's disease and others ulcerative colitis. The studies are listed across the top. The remission rates are on the right-hand side. Week 14 reporting, you can see 50% Crohn's, 40% ulcerative colitis. Going down the line, 50 to 60%, 40%. The third uh, study, the Farca study, had some mucosal healing data with complete mucosal healing in 27% and steroid-free mucosal healing in 47.6%. And then the bottom one uh, had quite high remission rates, but uh, again, these were uh, open label studies, so likely why the remission rates are quite robust in Crohn's disease and, and ulcerative colitis. In addition, CTP13 
was actually developed in Korea and has been evaluated in retrospective studies in Korea as well, both in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. We see excellent response and remission rates in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. But as Russ mentioned, these are not double-blind randomized control trials. They're more observational or retrospective or post-marketing studies uh, that help to support the totality of evidence regarding these agents as they've been viewed in, by the U.S. regulatory authorities. What's probably a little more interesting, I think, to the listeners are uh, randomized double-blind trials comparing the biosimilar to the branded uh, infliximab. In this case, uh, CTP13 was compared to the originator infliximab. They had a little over 100 patients in each group. And this is a week six outcomes. You can see the Crohn's disease activity index, the CDI 70 response rates, the CDI 100 response rates, and the clinical remission rates overlap extremely nicely. There are several different potential studies that we have alluded to regarding comparisons of the biosimilar with the originator. These include a transition study where patients who are randomized to receive either the reference drug or the biosimilar are then transitioned to the biosimilar. A single switch study where patients who are treated with the reference drug go through a single switch to the biosimilar. And then in order to achieve the concept of interchangeability that we'll get to in a moment, this requires multiple switches, not a single switch, but switches back and forth between the reference drug and the biosimilar to demonstrate that going back and forth does not influence either the efficacy the tolerability or the immunogenicity of an agent. And I'll point out now and then again later that to this point, there are no biosimilars that have achieved the status of interchangeability in the United States. Probably the best switch study so far that's been published is called the NOR switch study. This is interesting. So phase four study, uh, multiple indications, in Norway, it was actually run through the Norwegian government. They took patients who had either spondral arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or plaque psoriasis, nearly 500 patients. And for one year, patients who were well, actually, on the branded Remicade were randomized to uh, a non-inferiority study. They either stayed on the Remicade or were switched over to the biosimilar CTP13 both they and the investigators were blinded to whether they switched or not. This slide represents a pedogram of the variety of different indications. And although Russ mentioned that there were nearly 500 patients treated in the North switch study, when we look at each individual indication, these studies would have been relatively underpowered uh, to demonstrate non-inferiority between each individual indication, and hence the endpoint of the Norwich study was overall similarity. What we see is with both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, as well as the other rheumatologic and psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis studies, that there is no significant difference between the outcomes of patients treated in inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's with infliximab or CTP-13. One concern that people who reviewed this study had was the Crohn's disease data because it seemed from the previous uh, slide that the Crohn's disease patients seemed to may have been doing better on the infliximab originator. However, if you look at this graph on the left-hand side, there are 155 patients with Crohn's disease those who got the CTP13 are shown in red. Those who stayed with the, blindedly stayed with the infliximab originator are shown in blue. And over the first six months or so, the patients in blue seemed to go down on their Harvey Bradshaw index. Uh, 
um, while the CTP13 seemed to go up. However, following that out to one year, the curves overlap completely. And if you look on the right-hand side, no such difference was seen in ulcerative colitis. As an IBD specialist, you find it hard to believe that it would matter in Crohn's and not ulcerative colitis. Uh, as Steve mentioned, it wasn't really powered uh, to show uh, a big difference in the individual indications. Um, but these findings have led most of us to believe that even for Crohn's disease, um, the NOR switch uh, was probably adequate to convince us to be able to use uh, this agent. In addition to the clinical outcomes that Russ and I have alluded to, uh, it's important to recognize that there were also no differences in the development of anti-drug antibodies within the NOR switch study in patients who were continued on the uh, infliximab originator versus the patients who were then switched over to CTP13. So moving away from the NOR switch study, this actually is an interesting phase three transition study in patients with rheumatoid arthritis who are randomized to the SB2 uh, biosimilar infliximab or the branded uh, originator infliximab. They got the load week 0 to 6 and every eight weeks through week 46. And then at week 54, they were re-randomized to receive SB2 or continue the originating infliximab, and the patients who were receiving SB2 uh, continued to receive SB2. You can see, uh, as you follow this graph out, again, there's then three different groups, and the graphs overlap almost completely. So it's very hard to show a difference between these, and it looks like each group had about 100 patients in it. The investigators also evaluated the safety and immunogenicity of SB2 compared to infliximab in this rheumatoid arthritis population. And as you can see on this complicated table, looking at treatment emergent adverse events and serious ad events and infections and tuberculosis, as well as anti-drug antibody positivity, there were no significant differences in the patients who uh, continued on infliximab or SB2 compared to the patients who were switched from infliximab to SB2 in this RA population. So Steve, I guess the question is after we show this data, are you concerned um, about a patient doing well on, we'll say, infliximab, the branded uh, originator drug with Crohn's disease, let's say, who gets that letter from the insurance company saying that, yeah, we know you're doing well, but you got to switch to the uh, biosimilar infliction maybe if you want us to still pay for your medicine. Should you be concerned? Should our li listeners be concerned? I actually don't think so. We now have substantial data from both Europe and Asia in a variety of different populations with several different uh, biosimilar products as well as different compounds. So we talked about two biosimilars for adalumumab and two different biosimilars for infliximab, and they behaved appropriately and as expected within the clinical trial scenario. We recognize we are never going to get head-to-head -head trials with each of these in every indication, but I think to this point, we have several years of experience in hundreds of thousands of patients treated around the world. And frankly, in these substantial studies, we have not really seen any signal of concern for the currently approved biosimilars for infliximab or adalumumab. I agree entirely. We have another case. A 28-year-old patient with Crohn's disease failed myelin biologic therapies, was treated initially with brand name Remicade, infliximab at 5 milligrams per kilogram with a load in every eight weeks, and was doing well for two years, but now suddenly has flared, poorly controlled symptoms, ruled out infection, blood work sent, the infliximab drug levels are very low, and the anti-infliximab drug antibodies are very high. This is very important because our American Gastroenterological Association has advocated assessing loss of response by doing therapeutic monitoring for drug levels and anti-drug antibodies. And as you've identified, Russ, this patient actually had low levels of infliximab and high anti-drug antibodies. Now the question is, 
will the biosimilar behave in the same manner as far as immunogenicity is concerned. And as we've discussed extensively, these have to be compared in clinical studies in humans in a variety of different situations. And this slide represents studies of CTP-13 and Remicade in patients who have developed anti-drug antibodies, and we can see that they virtually replicate each other. Patients who have anti-drug antibodies to infliximab will have anti-drug antibodies to the biosimilars. Right, and you can even use the same assays to study that. Exactly. They will operate similarly with similar assays as they've been compared. I'm not aware of comparisons across assays, but within similar assays, as you say, they're going to behave similarly. As Steve mentioned, there are some recommendations for therapeutic drug monitoring in patients with active IBD treated with at least the anti-TNF agents. The AGA guidelines suggest reactive therapeutic drug monitoring to guide treatment changes where you check a trough level that's just before the next infusion or injection and you assess for the presence of anti-drug antibodies. Now, this table shows suggested trough concentrations. It says infliximab greater than or equal to five, but we do know that patients who are, have inflammation greater than five or at five, a lot of them do better at 10. And uh, there is recently data set showing that Crohn's patients with fistulas may need levels 15 or higher too. So just keep in mind that um, some of these levels may be a little low for some of your tougher patients. The adalimumab level is listed as greater than 7.5, which I think is probably a good number, although sometimes I've had to go higher. Sertilizumab pegol number is greater than 20. I don't uh, send much levels on uh, sertilizumab. And then the golimumab uh, levels, uh, the tr at least at the time of this printing, the, the trough concentration suggestion is not known. So as Russ has actually mentioned, the AGA does advocate this reactive testing for patients who have lost response to one or another agent. But these trough levels actually reflect more prospective levels that should be targeted. And here the AGA is not so agreeable. They do not believe, as Russ mentioned, that there are single target levels that are yet proven. And that's why Russ mentions that in different situations, there may be different target trough levels, such as in fistulizing disease, or even early on in patients with severe colitis who are losing drug into their feces, as we've seen with infliximab and, and likely all of the biologic agents. So, you know, this slide actually I think is a very helpful slide and I encourage people um, to keep this slide for your reference if you're not that familiar with the process. Uh, this tells you what do you do if you measure anti-drug levels and antibodies uh, with each result. So on the left-hand side, if you send anti-TNF levels and antibodies and you barely detect any drug but they're antibody negative, you increase the anti-TNF dose or decrease the dosing interval. In the middle, in green, it says, well, if you have a high drug level and you either have antibodies with a high level or no antibodies and the patient has active inflammation failing, then you would swap to another drug class, meaning you would leave the anti-TNF class in someone with a particularly, particularly very high level, uh, whether or not they had antibodies. And then on the right-hand side is if you have undetectable or low drug and you had positive antibodies, uh, if the antibodies are very low, um, you might be able to overcome that with a higher dose of your drug and adding an immune suppressant such as azathioprine, 6-MP, or methotrexate. But if the antibody level is high, then you, again, would cycle to another anti-TNF if they were previously a TNF responder or swap drug classes if, you know what, they never really were a TNF responder either. So I think the key points from this discussion are, number one, if you are going to do therapeutic drug monitoring, the levels that you're aiming for are going to be identical whether or not you're using the originator drug or the biosimilar. And the second key point is that if a patient develops anti-drug antibodies to the originator, they are going to have similar antibodies to the biosimilar, 
and of course vice versa. If a patient develops anti-drug antibodies to a biosimilar, they're going to have those same antibodies present to the originator. And in these situations, that switch should not occur, and we should be looking at a different formulation rather than a biosimilar. So as Russ has emphasized, different states have different regulations regarding substitution. But as far as interchangeability is concerned, we both mentioned that to date, none of the biosimilars have achieved the interchangeability designation from the FDA. And what that means is that in order to be interchangeable, there's another hurdle. Not only does it have to meet the criteria for the biosimilar, but the same clinical results have to occur when switched or alternated with the reference product. And a single switch study is not good enough. So uh, we talked about the North switch study, which is a single switch. There has been a study actually in psoriasis, the EGALITY study, that did show multiple switching um, for a different uh, product, for a Tanercept, and it's biosimilar, but it was not um, one of the biologics that we discussed. But it's presumed that the interchangeability will be only after multiple switch studies have been performed to show um, that the efficacy, safety, and immunogenicity remains within the realms uh, that the FDA permits. So we continue to emphasize that interchangeability has a different FDA designation than biosimilarity alone. And there are different standards that apply. These include this multiple switch study uh, that Russ has alluded to, as well as additional studies to evaluate pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic and immunogenicity and safety in patients undergoing these multiple switches. The actual data package of these study designs and endpoints may depend on the complexity of the molecule and the degree of analytic similarity, and uh, the FDA is going to make these uh, determinations for the companies that are seeking the concept of interchangeability. But as yet, these have not been applied. But I want to discuss one other aspect of this, because while the laws may suggest that we can't interchange, the practice may actually invoke that. So, Russ, what happens if insurance company in 2017 approves biosimilar A, and in 2018 it's biosimilar B? Have A and B been compared to each other? Well, and Steve, you bring up a, a very good point. So, no, they have not. So, a biosimilar is only biosimilar to the originator drug. That the FDA is, actually has no actual even statements about biosimilars being compared to each other, other than saying that biosimilarity is not involved, the FDA, as far as biosimilars being compared to each other. So we only know that the biosimilar is a biosimilar for the originator. So in the example, we have two infliximab biosimilars that you and I can prescribe today. We don't know if someone's on one switching back and forth between one and the other, if that is going to impact any of the outcomes that we looked at. So this interchangeability becomes rather complex in consideration. Uh, it may, by virtue of just third-party payers, be imposed upon us even in the absence of FDA designation. But from the regulatory agency's perception, a product with an interchangeable designation may be substituted without intervention. And Russ described this, that state substitution laws will actually impact on this practice, and it may be different between one state or another, but the biosimilar must be approved by the FDA as interchangeable in order to allow this substitution on a state-by-state -state basis. It gets very complex. The National Conference of State Legislatures has a web page that's referenced here, um, article in September of 2017, looking at state laws and legislation related to the biologic medications and substitution of biosimilars for light reading for the crowd. The website suggests that these regulations were performed in a very nice resort. 
So as we've emphasized, patient education is going to be very important. And, and we emphasize this because we need to understand these processes and the regulations and the data regarding biosimilars before we can actually uh, demonstrate our confidence in these uh, to our patients. So we need to be able to address their concerns. And we need to, as I say, emphasize our confidence in the regulatory processes that have uh, supported the approval of the different biosimilar formulations. But it's also important to recognize that the biosimilars cannot extend the indications. So in other words, whereas infliximab or adalumumab may be approved for moderate to severe Crohn's disease, that doesn't mean that we can use the biosimilar in mild disease or for other indications outside of the original labeling. Key messages from today that I hope uh, we brought across is the biologics, including the biosimilars, cannot be made generic. An approved biosimilar can be expected to have the same efficacy and safety profile as a reference product in the approved indications. Extrapolation is justified based on the totality of evidence. If a patient is doing well on a reference product, Data from switching studies suggest that similar efficacy and safety can be expected with a switch to a biosimilar, although again, only single switch studies have been published in IBD patients to date. Patients who have developed anti-drug antibodies to a given biologic should not be switched to another version of the same biologic, either the originator or the biosimilar. And the availability of biosimilars has the potential to broaden patient access to biologic therapies, and we also think bring down costs. And ultimately, it's, uh, it behooves us to be able to educate ourselves as well as our patients on this uh, expanding therapeutic opportunity that we really hope will eventually truly broaden patient access to these very important therapies for our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Well, we hope that this has been helpful for you today. Again, I'm Dr. Russell Cohen. Steve Hanauer. And we uh, discuss pinpointing the top questions and considerations about biosimilars in gastroenterology. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.